Good morning. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to Work Japan Talk Japan series. I am Giorgio, Work Japan Tour Operations Manager, and it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, my colleague and mentor, uh, Jamie uh, Dwyer, who will talk about our Kumano pilgrimage tour. Uh, before we uh, go ahead and uh, begin um, uh, the, the talk, uh, I'd like to do some, um, give you some guidelines so that you can make the most of today's um, speak um, talk. Thank you. Next. So uh, you will have noticed that uh, you are unable to uh, use your microphone or video, and we've uh, done this on purpose in order to uh, protect your privacy. We can see you, and you're welcome to contact us using the chat function on your um, Zoom um, screen. Uh, depending on the device that you're using, uh, you uh, may have different options on how to uh, select the chat. Uh, some devices uh, obscure the uh, actual chat button behind three little dots, which may be placed on one of the corners of your uh, screen. If you have any um, problems or questions, please contact us using the chat. And also, you're encouraged to use the chat to ask questions, which we will answer at the end of the talk. Please ask your questions as they come up so that we can collect them and put them together uh, at the end of the, today's talk. If for um, uh, time reason we are unable to answer all questions, please don't worry. Uh, we will um, be answering them by email uh, within a few days from today's event. Uh, speaking of today's event, uh, a recording of this event will be available for a short period of time on Japan's Vimeo channel, and we will be sending a link to uh, this recording by email after the event, of course, uh, for those who weren't able to sign up or uh, attend, and we will also send a feedback survey which we would be very grateful if you could um, complete as it can help us improve on what we do, but also find out what you would like us to do so that we can plan future events. And now without any further ado, I would like to leave the um, stage to Jamie Dwyer. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Giorgio. Good morning, everyone uh, from a very wet Kyoto countryside. Um, my name is Jamie, and uh, I look forward to uh, our, the talk and our, some questions at the end of today. Um, my name is Jamie Dwyer. Uh, I'm actually the self-guided tour manager for Walk Japan, uh, as well as a tour leader. And uh, I am Canada-born, New York and Chicago raised. Uh, I've been living in Japan for about 22 years, and I'm currently based um, in uh, the northern part of Kyoto Prefecture, about halfway between the city and the uh, Sea of Japan. Um, I uh, first came to Japan in 1999 uh, on a study abroad program. Uh, actually, it's interesting that uh, Giorgio and I were on the same program at the same time, and uh, we uh, both uh, left the, the Waseda program to go back to our respective homes, and then we met again uh, 15 years later at Walk Japan. Uh, after about eight years of living here and, and doing various uh, jobs, I went back to school on a government scholarship and got an MA in agriculture. Um, I was part of an education, an environmental education research lab there. And then I began working uh, soon after graduating from the, the University of Agricultural and Technology uh, with Walk Japan uh, as a freelance guide and in 2015, I started to develop their self-guided tours, uh, of which we have a number now. Um, but today I'm talking to you about uh, one of our most popular tours. Giorgio, if you listened to his last talk on the Nakasendo, uh, you, you would have heard about our flagship tour, um, the 11-day the, uh, uh, walk from Kyoto to Tokyo. Um, this is our second most popular tour, the Kumano Kodo, uh, and it is, uh, we started doing it in 2014, and then we, we began to introduce a self-guided version from 2016. Uh, this is a screenshot from our website, and it shows that uh, the guided tour here is eight nights and nine days. 
Uh, it begins in Osaka and finishes at Ise. And it's an activity level four, uh, which is one level above our Nakasendo tour. Uh, many people often ask what that, what that means. Uh, I'll give you some more details in a minute. And we have our self-guided tour, uh, which is a little bit shorter. It's six nights, seven days. Uh, it starts at a different point uh, at Yuasa, which is not feature on the guided tour. Um, and it ends at Shingu, which is um, sort of a more intuitive end for self-guided uh, customers. It is also labeled a level four. Uh, what that means is that uh, we have some uh, rockier ascents, um, some more routes on the terrain. Uh, this is not how the whole trail looks. It's a very well-kept, uh, well-maintained, beautiful trail throughout. Um, I'm just showing you sort of the Harrier's points here. Uh, we have some steeper, longer ascents compared to our Nakasendo. For comparison, uh, uh, the longest day on the Nakasendo is 24 kilometers, and there's a uh, elevation gain of about 500 or 600 meters. Um, whereas on the uh, our hardest day on, on this tour has an elevation gain of about a thousand meters. It's about uh, 3,300 feet. Uh, the days are not super long. Um, if you look just at the kilometers, at the distance wise, it's, it's, we have a 16 kilometer day in there. That's, that's one of the longest. Um, but I often tell people uh, that's not the point. So climbing Mount Fuji is only, only four kilometers. Uh, here we have the two maps that are featured on our website as well uh, for the guided and the self-guided walks. As you can see, uh, the uh, guided tour starts from Osaka. And this is because of uh, the ease of access from Osaka to Koyasan, uh, as well as the sort of contrast we want to show. Um, many people call uh, the area of Osaka that we stay in is, uh, is Namba. And uh, it is known for its nightlife. Uh, I've heard people say it's kind of like visiting Babylon before going on your very remote sort of ascetic pilgrimage to the mountains. Um, and yeah, uh, Osaka is, is uh, the Namba area in particular is quite exciting. Uh, we, we see the culture of kui daure, the, the eat until you drop culture that is uh, one of Osaka's uh, main, main selling points for domestic tourism. Um, the next day we take a train to Koyasan and it winds its way through the mountains uh, to where we will then get on a cable car and reach the beginning of our walk, which I will give you some more details in a minute. From there, we travel down to the uh, sort of iconic Kumano Kodo area. Uh, there's many different routes, uh, but we begin our, uh, our journey into the mountains of the Kumano area from Takijiri Oji uh, along the Nakahechi route, which is one of the most popular walking routes. Uh, from there, the core tour heads on to Shingu. And then at the end, we take a train up to Ise to visit the Grand Shrine there. And what we're trying to accomplish is uh, all of our tours in some way sort of um, delve into the spiritual uh, aspect of Japan. But this tour really uh, takes it to another level where we try to show you things that are uh, very iconically Buddhist, then very uh, iconically Shinto and a mystic religion followed by the uh, organic mix of all of these that existed for centuries. Uh, if you look at the self-guided tour on the right, again, we start from Yuasa, which is a small fishing village, uh, which is known for uh, being the birthplace of soy sauce. They have a very strong sort of fermentation culture there. Uh, and then, as I've mentioned, we, we stop at Shingu uh, from where um, you could decide to go to Ise or back to Osaka, Kyoto. Um, we provide tickets from this point uh, for onward travel. Uh, so uh, what we'll talk about uh, for the remainder is the ins and outs of the Kumano Kodo. And uh, I will get into some detail, but of course, uh, there's lots of information about the Kumano Kodo online. Uh, you can find uh, some, very, some very good, uh, well-written information in English there as well. Um, on our tour, we have nine days to go through much of this. So I, I of course, cannot um, hit all of the important points, but this is just sort of an introduction for you. Um, so um, the Kumano Kodo itself, what is it? 
Um, this is a series of ancient routes that encompass the, the Kihanto. Uh, that's the largest peninsula on the mainland of Japan. Um, it encompasses uh, parts of Osaka and Nara and Wakayama and Mie. And in 2004, uh, the Kumano paths, as well as a number of uh, sacred sites on, these, on this peninsula, were granted collective UNESCO World Heritage status. Um, there are actually only two UNESCO listed pilgrimages in the world. Uh, the other is the uh, Camino de Santiago uh, in Spain and France and Portugal. And uh, these two pilgrimages have a formal relationship where if you complete sections of both, you can gain official uh, dual pilgrimage status, uh, which is nice. You get, you get a nice little pin and a folder. Uh, the central nexus of all of the key Hanto pilgrimage routes is what's called the Kumano Sanzan. And these are three holy precincts that were originally of natural design uh, and are now represented by three grand shrines called Taisha. Uh, there's Hongu Taisha, Nachi Taisha, and Hayatama Taisha. Uh, and in terms of a pilgrimage goal, um, entry into the more isolated Hongu Valley and arriving at Hongu uh, Taisha Grand Shrine signifies sort of a rebirth. Um, after your, your metaphorical death in the mountains. Um, not to scare anyone, um, it's not that hard. Uh, this is somewhat akin to reaching the Cathedral of, of Santiago de Compostela uh, on the Camino, but uh, no one grand shrine of the three takes precedence in that way, uh, at least in modern times. Uh, so each grand shrine um, has its own main uh, origin deity as a focal point, um, but they also all in turn uh, the other 11 uh, sometimes 12 Kumano deities. And these gods are, are called Gongen in Japanese. So um, they are sort of a, a, an organic mix of Shinto and Buddhist um, and mountain asceticism, uh, as well as folklore tradition. And uh, this spiritual melting pot aspect of the tour is one of its key features. So we talk about it quite a bit. And you may hear some big words like uh, um, syncretism or spiritual amalgamation. Uh, the coexistence of Shinto animism and Buddhist and in, in Buddhist deities in one form. Um, this process in Japanese is called Honji Suijaku, and the result is Shinbutsu Shugo, or the tandem worship of um, what may be considered opposing spiritual beliefs. Uh, as I mentioned, there are a number of routes that uh, are uh, a part of the Kumano Kodo network. And uh, we can trace uh, the waves of spiritual activity along these routes from at least 1100 years ago. Um, so in the year uh, 907, uh, Emperor Uda uh, undertook a journey from the Kyoto capital and that took uh, about a month. And following his, his uh, footsteps, uh, other emperors and members of the imperial aristocracy would uh, also search for purification and spiritual rebirth along the route. Um, so this period, the 12th and uh, 13th centuries, are considered sort of the peak time uh, for processions along it. Uh, our first detailed record of the pilgrimage is a diary written by one of these elites in 1108. And that document is, is very important for providing legitimacy to uh, the various uh, spiritual uh, nexus points. These, these are called oji along the path. Uh, when you walk these in succession, and you follow strict purification rituals along the way, um, then you would be primed for your, your death in the mountains to be followed by rebirth in the Hongu Valley. Uh, pilgrims would purify themselves also in the healing onsen uh, geothermal hot springs at Yunomine uh, before paying homage to the gods at Hongu. And there were multiple points for this, uh, rivers and waterfalls along the way. Finally, wading through the waters around the Oyunohara sandbar uh, to reach the original location of the Hongu Grand Shrine. Many pilgrims would then travel by boat down the Kumano River uh, to Hayatama Grand Shrine before then walking to Nachi Grand Shrine with its uh, iconic waterfall, the highest waterfall in Japan. Uh, many people would then return to Hongu via two steep mountain passes and then retrace their route home. Or they may take the uh, Iseji route or the Kohechi route to visit Ise Grand Shrine or, or Koyasan. Uh, so the six main routes uh, are the Kiji, which goes along the western coast down from Osaka. Uh, there's the Kohechi, which is uh, about 70 kilometers from Koyasan uh, down to a point just before Hongu Grand Shrine. Um, there's Nakahechi, which is our most popular route, which starts from Tanabe 
and uh, moves uh, from west to east to Hongu. Uh, and then you have uh, the Ohechi, which goes around the base of the peninsula, uh, not as walked now and more developed at, at a number of points. Um, so there are two or three passes that some people will take side trips to there. Uh, there's the Iseji, which is uh, the old uh, route from uh, Kumano Hayatama uh, up to Ise Grand Shrine. And then there's the Omine Okugake Michi, uh, which is not walked much uh, by tourists. This is a uh, traditionally a training area for Yamabushi uh, mountain ascetic monks. Um, yeah, so let me tell you a bit about the themes and the tools to enlightenment that we encounter along our tour. Uh, I mentioned briefly the Oji. Uh, these are called the 99 Oji. And uh, what they are, are these points that sometimes are marked by a rock, sometimes a small shrine. Um, there were five very important Oji along the route. Uh, two of those we visit. You can see them on the bottom there. Uh, Takijiri Oji and Hoshinmon Oji. And these were basically points where um, the, the guides of these imperial processions uh, called Yamabushi uh, or Sendatsu, uh, leaders of, of sort of spiritual training along the route, uh, designated spots where you would um, have a purification rite or some sort of ritual. Um, they would also probably be places to uh, drop some devotional support. So you can imagine the more you have, the better. 99, 99 we say, uh, is the number for the OG, but this is uh, really just a term that means there were a lot. Uh, the OG also served an important purpose of being uh, the distance markers for pilgrims to, to follow. Um, you might've heard in Giorgio's talk, uh, we had other distance markers called Ichi Rizuka. It's the one on the left here um, that designated four kilometers. Uh, along the route, uh, 2.5 miles along the route. Uh, this is really a distance marker that, that appears in the feudal period. Uh, the OG precede that. And then today we have other markers as well. Uh, the route is very well marked um, from one to 75. Um, these are uh, uh, half kilometer marker points. Another very important aspect of uh, the tour is uh, mandalas. And when I say mandala, you might think of the uh, maybe Tibetan sort of sand mandalas or, or a point of concentric circles with a, a focal point for meditation. Um, those also exist uh, in Japan. But in this case, the mandalas are uh, more like giant pictures. And they represent um, the different areas that you will uh, kind of your goals for, for this pilgrimage route. Um, they're pictorial representations of the spiritual realms within these geographic spaces, uh, sometimes very confined spaces as well. And right here, I have a picture of the Nachi Grand Shrine uh, Mandala, as well as the Hayatama Grand Shrine Mandala on the right. Um, you can see it's a very busy picture. Um, to effectively understand what is going on, uh, you would need an interpreter. And if you look on the left here, you see a, a woman wearing red and white. Um, this is a bhikkhuni nun. So the bhikkhuni nuns uh, travel throughout Japan and uh, spread the word of Kumano. Um, and they would do so in a way uh, that was different from other Buddhist traditions. Um, there was no uh, discrimination between gender or class. Uh, economic status. Um, anyone was invited to Kumano, and this is a very important part of, of the route. Historically, uh, the universality of, of the Kumano route um, was one of its selling points. Um, the bhikkhuni would travel throughout Japan. There's rumors they would even um, enter sort of the poorest districts, uh, would become prostitutes themselves so they, they could join the networks of, of destitute there. Um, and they would have these mandalas that they would use to uh, explain what the spiritual purpose was of the pilgrimage. Um, they said, uh, this is called etoki or, or the reading of the picture, uh, the interpretation of the picture. 
um, where they would likely point at different points and, and in a very sing-songy way, um, almost preaching, they would describe what was happening uh, at, at different uh, sections of the route. Um, I try to do this on the tour a little bit. I won't regale you too much with uh, my sing-songy voice, but uh, you can imagine they, they say, and looking underneath this waterfall, you see the disgraced samurai who had to stand here supported by the Kumono gods for so many days, that sort of thing. I do it better on tour. Uh, yes, what else? The Yategarasu. This is a very important uh, symbol uh, throughout the Kumano Kodo pilgrimage, especially along the Nakahechi uh, just before Hongu Taisha and at the Grand Shrine entrances. Uh, the Yategarasu is described as the three legged crow in the Kumano tradition. And there's many competing theories for the origins of this crow. Uh, its name actually simply means eight hand lengths. And this is a, a very massive crow. There, there's um, also mention of eight trays that are laid out for it to eat upon. It's, it's unclear what the symbology is, but there's, there's plenty of room for conjecture and many, many do. Um, there's no mention of three legs anywhere in the oldest depictions of the bird. Um, for example, the Kojiki mentions the Yatagarasu, uh, but doesn't say anything about why or if it has three legs. But later political movements in the area probably had an influence. And some people think that um, the three legs represents the power of three traditional clans that ruled the area. Um, it's at least agreed upon that Yatagarasu is a messenger from the sun, and most famously, a guide to legendary Emperor Jimu in the year 660 BC. Uh, leading him to help found the Yamato capital of Japan. Um, when you go along the route, uh, when we stop at the Grand Shrines, there are a number of amulets and protective um, elements, uh, things that you can buy to show your devotion and to help you uh, throughout your life. I always encourage people to uh, buy the Gohoin. It's also called Okorasu-san. Uh, which is a simple piece of paper that each shrine has this design on. Um, they're each just a little bit different and there's a stamp from the shrine as well. Uh, traditionally, this would have been hung uh, over the hearth or at the entranceway to your home. And it would protect you from evil. Um, it, would, it would keep you from becoming sick. Um, there's rumors that the bhikkhuni nuns would also pass these out to people and would encourage people to eat them to fully imbibe the powers of Kumano before be beginning their pilgrimage. So uh, the stories behind the stories, you know, um, one of our jobs as tour leaders is to interpret the old stories in a modern context. And uh, we, we have to stay true to the official folklore, but we also add in our own background research or our own interpretive flair. Um, so I have a number of stories here. Uh, which I cannot get to all of them today, but I'm showing you this slide now because um, you, can, you can take a look and if there's any that really pique your interest, please put the number into the comments and uh, Giorgio will, will take the most chosen number, most popular story, and I will see if we have time to go through it at the end here. And just very quickly, uh, you can see we have a story about a spontaneously combusting monk, uh, we have a story of the, the wolves of the north, the northern Fujiwara. Um, if you enjoy Game of Thrones, there's a lot of parallels there. Uh, there's uh, Izumi Shikibu. Uh, was she a femme fatale or Japan's first feminist poet? Uh, there's the story of Emperor Kazan, who was a, a devout uh, walker along the pilgrimage routes, but uh, was he maybe not so bright? Uh, there's Fujiwara no Teika, uh, who's a the very well-known poet uh, who, if you uh, have ever played the Japanese card game Karuta, he's the one who thought of all of the 100 poems for Karuta. Um, sorry, he, he didn't think them up. He chose them from uh, a number of famous poets in Japan. Uh, but even though he was a man of words, he could not find the words at one point along the Kumano. Uh, we have various references to snakes that have all sorts of symbology along the route. Um, there's also the story of Oguri Hangan, uh, sort of a playboy who uh, 
was sent to hell and came back. Well, I won't go through it all now. If you're interested, please, please choose that one. There's Bad Shiro, kind of the Paul Bunyan of Kumano, um, and a number of other ones. So uh, I will show this slide again a bit later, and you can choose if you like. Um, what I'd like to do now is just go through a few of the days. Of course, I, I don't have time to go through every day on the tour, but just to give you an idea of the terrain and, and what we see um, at some of the points, um, the sort of pivotal spots that, that uh, uh, define our Walk Japan itinerary. Um, so as I mentioned, the guided tour uh, stops at Koyasan. And this is the headquarters of the Shingon esoteric Buddhist faith. Uh, founded by Kukai in the year 816. And uh, Kukai uh, is still present here, uh, meditating for all of us 1,200 years later. Um, he is present uh, in the Okuno Inn Cemetery. And uh, food is brought to him every day. Um, and many people pay homage to Kukai, especially if you're going to walk the Shikoku uh, 88 Temple Pilgrimage. You must first come to Koyasan to ask for uh, Kukai's blessing, and then come back uh, when you finished to thank him for the trip. On our tour, we do a, a route called the Nyonin Michi. And traditionally, uh, women were not allowed to enter uh, the precincts of Koyasan. Uh, now, of course, they may. Uh, but because they couldn't enter, there were seven spots uh, around the uh, perimeter of the town where women could do a pilgrimage of sorts. And uh, it's no walk in the park. Um, we, we don't walk all of it, of course, um, but we go through about 7.5 kilometers of it along our tour. Here's some pictures to give you some context there. So what we do is we uh, continue from the beginning of the Nyonin Michi, once we've taken a train and a cable car and a bus uh, for a short time, just about 10 minutes by bus to the start of the trail. Uh, we begin uh, up the, the mountainside and we go down again to the Chumong gate. This is the Western gate here. Uh, we continue on and we eventually make it uh, to a parking lot, uh, which doesn't, seem like a very nice end to the trail, but just across uh, the bridge from the parking lot is the entranceway to the Okunoin Cemetery. Uh, so if you come to Koyasan, there are three points that you really must see. The cemetery, uh, Kongobuji, the, the main temple of Koyasan, uh, and uh, the Danjo Garan, which I will get to in a minute. After we've walked through the, uh, the cemetery and uh, paid a visit to Kukai himself, at the Gobyo. Uh, this is a lantern hall. Um, and in the back part of it, Kukai is, is in his eternal meditation. Uh, we walk back to our inn. And on this tour, we stay at a Shukubo, which is a, uh, a temple uh, sort of stay for pilgrims, especially. Um, there's actually 117 temples at Koyasan. And of those, uh, 52 are Shukubo. And they specialize in uh, shojin ryori, which is this style of uh, vegetarian cuisine. Um, they also do ritual morning prayers. Um, some of them do a type of meditation that's called ajikan, which is uh, particular to the esoteric Buddhist faith. And they also do gomataki, which is this fire ceremony. Um, so we stay at a number of different shukubo in the area. Um, some of them have monks who are more veteran monks, others younger monks in training. Um, they all have sort of a nice, uh, each, each temple has its own special sort of atmosphere. You can see in this picture, one of our tours, uh, we are eating on the floor here uh, and everyone is very nicely trying to sit on their knees. Don't worry, you do not have to do so. Uh, I think everyone very quickly switch back to a more comfortable sitting position after this photo. And they actually, do, they do have um, tables and higher seats that you can sit on to eat as well. The following morning, we visit the Kongobuji uh, temple as well as the Danjo Garan. 
And I just want to give you a quick look at the Danjo Garan here. Um, Danjo Garan translates to sort of a, an altar for the temples. And it's a flat area that has a number of important sites. Um, and it's considered the, the sort of centerpiece of Koyasan. So as we walk uh, the day prior around the perimeter of Koyasan, we can see that there's a number of mountains. Um, there's no mountain called Koyasan. That's the name of the town itself. Um, but the surrounding mountains are meant to represent uh, the eight petals of a lotus flower. And within the center of that flower is this very large towering orange pagoda. Um, so the central focal point of Koyasan is here. Um, there's actually a, uh, a special order that you must go into the Danjo Garan. Uh, some, some of our tour leaders do it, others decide to just allow people to wander around on their own. Um, but uh, I usually lead people in the order uh, for about halfway through uh, before releasing them to, to take pictures and things. Um, but uh, some of the important points here, if you look at the uh, top left corner, we have a, a tree. This is a, a pine tree that Kukai supposedly threw his Vajra from China uh, towards Japan and it landed in this tree. The Vajra is this Buddhist uh, tool that's used in rituals um, throughout the prayers. They will, they will sort of shake this around and do different things with it. Um, again, esoteric means that uh, unlike other styles of Buddhism in Japan, um, the teaching is passed down from master to disciple. So Shingon, this, the name of this faith means the, the true word. Um, it quite literally is the true word of Kukai that has been passed down exactly from master to disciple for 1200 years. Um, so he gained the true word from a monk in China, then threw his Vajra across the waters, landed in this tree. And when he went looking for the site for his headquarters for uh, the faith, he found the Vajra glowing here in the tree. Other points we visit just below that, we see the Western Pagoda. This is my favorite uh, uh, pagoda of, of the bunch, just because it's not painted in an opulent way and has a, a very clear uh, style of architecture. Um, you can see the joinery very closely. At the top picture, we have the Kondo, the main prayer hall. Uh, and at the bottom, uh, middle, we have the Miedo, which is where Kukai went into his eternal meditation before being transferred to the uh, cemetery uh, at the back of Okunoin. Uh, we have a very large bell on the bottom right there, uh, which is the fourth largest bell in Japan. This is rung six times a day. So we uh, hear it, uh, if not while we're visiting the Danjo Garan, Garan, then when we are walking the day prior. And of course, the centerpiece up above is the most important point, the Kompon Daito, it's called. So this is the main uh, pagoda. It, its shape is actually like that of um, the grave sites in the cemetery. They're called Gorinto, and they're meant to represent the universe in total in its design. So the bottom square section is the earth. Above that is a, a rounder section that's considered water. Uh, then another. Uh, the eaves above that, that section is fire. Then you have another section above that's wind. And finally at the top, there's a jewel that is meant to represent um, what used to be called ether, uh, but something that permeates the whole universe. We might call it dark matter now or something. Uh, if you see that little diagram next to it, you also see that the Kompon Daito Pagoda is a mandala itself. Um, inside there's a 3D representation of, of the cosmos via Buddhist statues. So the cosmic Buddha is in the center, uh, Dainichi, and he is surrounded by four other Buddhist statues. And then there are complementary columns of 16 uh, bodhisattva uh, Buddhist saints. And if you look at it uh, up close, it, when you're inside, you may not realize that it's a mandala, but if you imagine looking above, uh, in from the sky down, this this pagoda is sort of a a uh, um, antenna shape, reaching up into the heavens. So if you're looking straight down on it, it is a concentric uh, 
mandala with the cosmic Buddha in the center. Uh, I was very lucky on one of my tours, a custom tour, to be able to see the commemoration ceremony uh, for Koyas, the Chumon Gate at Koyasan. This was a gate that burnt down at the end of the 19th century um, and was not rebuilt until 2014. Uh, and imagine my surprise when we are, uh, though I knew that the event was happening, I did not know that the top ranked sumo wrestlers were all coming as well uh, to stamp out the evil from the gate. So they went through a, a large ceremony and I enjoy sumo. So it was quite a surprise for me to see uh, Hakuho, the, the top ranked Yokozuna uh, sumo wrestler walk just a few feet past me. I think I was way more excited than the people I was leading on the tour on this day. Uh, also, when we visit the Danjo Garan, you may see the practicing monks. The Koyasan does have a university and the monks will come to the Danjo Garan area to practice their mantras. Uh, here they are uh, repeating a mantra, mantra to the historic Buddha, uh, the, the Buddha who sits underneath the Bodhi tree, you may know from the Indian tradition. Um, yeah, and I'll just play a little video video here of them doing that. <laughs> hear that. It looks like my settings are telling me you may not have been able to, but they were repeating the, uh, the mantra over and over again to the historic Buddha. Uh, so from Koyasan, we travel down by, uh, on our guided tour, we go by a reserved vehicle down to the uh, beginning of the Nakahechi route, uh, where we start our sort of official pilgrimage to the Kumano Sanzan, the three grand shrines. And as we do so, uh, we start the day at Takijiri Oji, um, which is one of the five important Oji I mentioned. It's not a long day. It's only about 4.5 kilometers, 2.8 miles. But you can see that it begins with a, a steepish up. Um, so we go from 100 meters up to 370. And then down again and up again to reach Takahara or the high plain town. Usually right around the middle of that first ascent, people start to question if they've chosen the right tour, but we assure them that uh, this is not how it all feels. And here are some um, pictures from the route. Again, you start at the confluence of two rivers where Takijiri Oji is, a, a site for ritual purification. And uh, then we follow past a number of Jizo statues. I think Giorgio mentioned in the last talk what Jizo means. Uh, Takahara village, that is our goal, has six uh, important Jizo. Um, and Jizo is a general term here, uh, which also encompasses uh, other Buddhist statues, not just the iconic Jizo. Um, the bottom left picture here is of the Hari Jizo, which means needle Jizo. Uh, and it is a, a Buddhist bodhisattva saint dedicated to dentistry. So people with toothaches will come here to be cured. Uh, we also pass the Chichiwa rock on the bottom right here, which is a place where one of the Fujiwara uh, family uh, from the north had to leave their, their newborn child to be fed by the milk of wolves. Uh, I can tell you a bit more about that later if you're more interested. And then we reach the uh, very nice terraced rice fields of Takahara, a small village only 40 households here, uh, about 100 people. Uh, half of them are, are retirees or have um, newly moved in to try to live sort of sustainable lifestyles on the mountainside here. Uh, we stay at a few different accommodation along the way. Uh, we meet some very nice locals. Here we have uh, Jian San, um, 
many people will remember him fondly if they've been on the Kumano Koto pilgrimage. Uh, he is a very charismatic person who runs his own inn here. And the views from uh, your rooms are fantastic, as well as the food. John San, if you're lucky, might uh, play his flamenco guitar for you and uh, tell you a bit about his history of, of running a tapas bar in Osaka. The following day, uh, we continue our walk about nine kilometers. Um, leaving Tagahara, we, we pass uh, this nice pony. Uh, we start up some cobblestone. If you've walked our Nakasendo route, you'll know that there is some cobblestone there. Uh, the Kumano has a lot more. We pass the Takahira Ike Pond, and again, a number of Jizo. We must stop for lunch, of course, and uh, there's a, a perfect spot along the way. Um, it's a, a rest stop that has a little restaurant there with a lot of local specialties. So in particular, uh, Jabara, this is a citrus, uh, kind of a lime tasting citrus that's grown in the area. There's lots of Jabara juice and Jabara candies. Um, also, Wakayama Prefecture uh, is known for its pickled plums. So here they have a, some udo noodles uh, that are flavored with pickled plum. And also, uh, various kinds of mountain sushi. So of course, without direct access to the ocean, traditionally, um, they would have sushi that was pickled, uh, pickled mackerel, pickled uh, Pacific salary. Uh, they also had rice that was wrapped in mustard leaves called meibari sushi. So that means um, it makes you open your mouth wide or your eyes wide as you eat it due to the size of it. It's, it makes you go, wow, what a big rice ball. Uh, we continue our walk and we, we come to another site of ritual purification, of course, at a, at a river. Um, so uh, this is Chikatsuyu town. The name of Chikatsuyu is, is fairly unique. Uh, the original translation is the blood or dew town. And that goes back to a story about Emperor Kazan, which I don't have time to regale here, but again, if you're interested, um, I can tell you a bit later. And from there, um, those who would like can stay in Chikatsuyu uh, to relax a bit, or we can continue on our last four kilometers uh, all up to a final goal of another oji called Sugizakura oji. On this day, we have a reserved vehicle, so it's easy to work around people who would rather take a break somewhere. Some more stories, oops, excuse me. Some more stories here. Um, again, I'm looking at the time and I think we'll have to come back to these, um, but uh, some iconic images from the day. And then we continue on, um, to Hongu Taisha. So it takes us three days from Takijiri Oji to make it to Hongu. And again, all roads of the pilgrimage sort of lead to Hongu. Uh, we offer on our self-guided tour, we offer the opportunity to walk all the way through, uh, but that's not necessarily our recommended course. So on the guided tour, we, we don't do that. Um, we instead start from Hoshimon Oji, you can see, uh, about three fourths of the way through this, this graph. And from there, it's mostly down to the Grand Shrine. We can take it at a very relaxed pace and have plenty of time to enjoy the shrine at the end. Here's some images from our self-guided materials. We give you maps along the way to show you important points as well as some historical and cultural information to, to give it context. And uh, there are opportunities for a quick coffee break. Uh, there's an onsen coffee spot. Uh, as well as uh, we have a, an alternative pass that we can take once we have finished our visit to the Grand Shrine. And that's on the top right photo there. Um, there's some wonderful views. Um, just before reaching the Grand Shrine, uh, we have this very iconic view of uh, the Oyunohara site. Um, down below is the largest Tori gate in all of Japan. And it uh, is the gateway to the original site of the shrine. Uh, this is still considered the most holy spot for many Yamabushi ascetic monks who travel here. Um, they'll still wade through the waters of the, of the river 
to pray at the Oyunohara site. And I've, I only know this because I've met a Yamabushi and talked to him and he gave me his card and it was still wet from, from having waded through the river here. Um, but uh, in 1889, there was a very large typhoon uh, that rose the water level about 23 meters above the trees <clears throat> and completely washed away uh, the original Hongu Taisha shrine. Um, the monks uh, were able to retrieve the remains of five of the 12 deities, uh, and they rebuilt these shrines at the point where we visit on our tour. I'll just skip this, sorry, not enough time to go through, but uh, this is just detailing how the forest is used still to this day. Um, along the way, we have a number of points where we encounter history and, and kind of feel like you're walking together with these people from the 11th century, 12th century. Um, of course, one of my favorites is uh, Fushiogami. And this is the view from Fushiogami. Uh, Fushiogami means to, to prostrate yourself. It's the first point that you would be able to see the Hongu Valley. So you can imagine for someone who had traveled 30 days from the Kyoto capital or longer, um, sometimes with nothing, no, no money to their name, but just coming for spiritual salvation. Uh, they would be able to see the Hongu Valley after a very long trip and they would fall to the ground and, and pray to the gods here. Um, there is a story of uh, Izumi uh, Shikibu, who is a, a very famous poet from the 11th century. Uh, she's one of the 36 immortal uh, female poets. And uh, this is her story here is one that really exemplifies sort of the universality of the Kumano root. Um, so when she arrives, uh, she uh, unfortunately is stopped by, um, by her uh, monthly obstruction, um, her menstrual cycle. So in the Shinto tradition, you're not allowed to, uh, to visit holy sites uh, if you have one of the three impurities, uh, the red, the white, and the black. So if anything connected to red is blood, anything white, uh, anything black, sorry, is connected to death. Um, and anything white is actually connected to childbirth. Um, anything having to do with, with uh, bodily fluids really is considered impure in this Shinto tradition. So technically she was not supposed to continue walking even though she was so close to the Hongu shrine. And uh, she goes to sleep here and she has a dream. And she wakes up and writes a poem about her dream. So um, she mentions how she is, uh, basically the moon is, is her monthly obstruction has occurred and the moon is stopping her from continuing. Um, and the gods actually answer her and say like, how could we, the gods who are also born from the dust be able to stop you from continuing on your way? Uh, so she takes this as a message to, that it's okay for her to continue the pilgrimage. Uh, now, Izumi Ishikubu was also known as sort of the femme fatale uh, figure in Kyoto at the time. She had many lovers and she, she had sort of a reputation that may have forced her to come to Kumano to sort of be purified and reborn before returning to the capital. Um, and uh, though she had this reputation, she shows a lot of power here, I think. Uh, so this might be one of the first examples of of, a very, of women's rights in action uh, in Japan as she uh, pushes forward on the, on the trail, um, not disregarding the spiritual beliefs, but recognizing that there's a mixed sort of spiritual narrative here that allows her to continue on. So we eventually reach a Hongu Grand Shrine. And um, here, of course, we can't take pictures inside, but you can see a uh, picture from the old shrine when it was on the sandbar at Oyunohara. Uh, there's an order to go into uh, the shrine and pray at each of the five main deities there. Kumano is represented by uh, the brother figure in Japan's origin story, Susanao. Um, and his name is conflated with a bunch of other deities uh, at, at this point. Um, so it's considered a, a god that is not Susanao, alone, but also a number of different deities that protect the forest. 
uh, after going to Kumano, we spent two nights on both of our tours, the guided and the self-guided uh, in Yunumine Onsen area. This is an important part of the pilgrimage narrative as well, because pilgrims would have, uh, after a very long journey, tried to uh, have a final sort of rest and purification here before uh, visiting the grand shrines. Um, they lay claim to being the oldest onsen in Japan, though I can think of a number of other onsen that would contest that. Uh, Dogo Onsen in particular, I think might have something to say about that to Yunumine Onsen. Uh, but uh, the bathing culture is uh, quite a nice goal for the end of a long day's walk. We then go over two sort of larger passes. And like all of our tours, we uh, tend to try to build up in um, degree of difficulty so that your legs get used to, to walking on, on more undulating terrain. And then near the end, we will have often a more challenging day, but also alternative outs along the day. Um, so you'll know your own energy levels, uh, how you're feeling, and uh, many people feel more comfortable after a couple of days walking to make the call on whether or not they can do uh, the harder days, excuse me, the, ch the more challenging days. Um, and this day, you know, to compare, you started at Takijiri Oji with a 300 meter ascent, um, like a thousand foot ascent, but then you've got uh, that 300 meters in, in just the first two kilometers of this walk. Um, followed by another 500 meter ascent. Um, so in total, it's about 1,000 meters, about 3,300 feet of, of elevation gain throughout. And to avoid this large section, we do have the opportunity for people to take uh, a taxi to the Jizojaya lunch point. And from there, it's still not a walk in the park. There's a quite steep ascent, but uh, at least you will have um, had a bit of a rest before uh, if you decided to opt out of the first steep ascent. Again, these are some maps from our self-guided materials. I won't go into them in too much detail, but uh, this gives you an idea of that longer day. Um, we have support guides as well who help us on a number of these days. So um, our, our tours are capped at 12 people, um, but 12 people can spread out quite a bit uh, uh, depending on pace and energies on these longer ascents. So we always have a support guide who helps. Um, and uh, this is Kyoko-san. So she is a local artist. Uh, she does a lot of the uh, postcards and t-shirts that you'll find at the shops around Kumano. Um, and She's also, uh, she doesn't sell herself that much, but she's, she's originally the fastest runner along this very difficult or more challenging section that we walk. Uh, so in, when, in her high school days, I believe, or maybe college days, she ran a route that we walk over the course of uh, about six hours and she was able to do it in two, I think. Um, and without fail, whenever we reach this point in, in the photos, she will always stop and face everyone. And we're taking a bit of a rest here. And uh, though she doesn't speak much English, she will say in very clear English at this point, this is my mountain. And it is, she owns this section of the route. Um, and she's always asking us for help to take care of the trees and things. So uh, if you are, if you fall in love with Kumano and would like to do a bit more uh, local, local maintenance, you can help Kyoko-san take care of her forest. This is a picture of the Ogumo Torigoi, the, the very uh, challenging walk from Koguchi up over one of the mountain passes. And once you get to the top, you'll, you're able to see uh, the ocean from here. And then it's a steep down to the Nachi Grand Shrine. Here's some photos from the trail. Again, there's some steeper, slipperier terrain. We don't go fast. We take everything at a walk Japan pace. Um, there are people who like to go ahead and uh, we do not try to stop them, but we certainly say, please wait for us at certain points so that we can check and make sure that they're okay. 
And eventually we reach the grand shrine of Nachi. Um, this is where the mother figure in the origin story of Japan is housed. And Nachi is also where the Yatagarasu bird supposedly came back uh, after leading Emperor Jimu to found the Yamato capital. He flew back here and turned into a rock. So they have a little shrine dedicated to, to the bird here. There's also Seigan Toji Temple, which is a 16th century Buddhist temple uh, that for centuries coexisted with the, the Grand Shrine next door um, until uh, the Meiji period when Shinto and Buddhism were sort of forcibly ripped apart. Uh, there's also a very large camphor tree that you can walk into and climb through uh, on the grounds of the Grand Shrine. So this is the Goshinboku, the, the divine uh, tree that many shrines will have. This one is quite impressive. And of course, the, the main star of the show at Nachi is the waterfall. Uh, so this is the highest waterfall in Japan. Um, it's 133 meters high, and there's 133 steps to get down to it. Uh, depending on the waterfall, on the rainfall uh, throughout the week, uh, it can be just a little wisp of water or quite a deluge. Uh, of course, uh, we see it in all different aspects. We see it from far away and close up as well. Uh, we, we get as close as we can to fully uh, kind of receive the spiritual power of the waterfall. Um, this is a place where there's actually one extra Kumano deity. So most of the grand shrines have 12, um, whereas at Nachi there's 13 in total because of the original uh, Hidu, it's called a deity that exists in the waterfall. And here I'm just showing some photos of the accommodation um, that we may use on this tour. Um, this is from two nights. There's a, a mountain sort of lodge that is a converted school. And we have a smaller dinner, dinner venue in the center here for our self-guided tour. Um, we also go to Katsuruda, Katsuruda uh, town, which is a small fishing town after our visit to the Nachi Grand Shrine. And uh, we will stay on an island here and have quite a nice spread of uh, sort of a celebratory meal to, to uh, say that everyone has done a good job going up and down the, the very large pass. Um, they also have cave onsen on some of these island uh, sort of resort areas. And uh, I'm just showing you a video here very quickly of the uh, very rough sea area. Um, but this is actually from the outdoor onsen. Um, Look, I was lucky to be there when no one else was around and could take a quick video. Uh, what I don't show you here is that to the upper left are the uh, is the hotel and our rooms. <laughs> and uh, you can actually see into the men's outer onsen from here. Uh, it's very far away. Uh, you have to be looking very intentionally to see anything. Uh, but for those in the onsen, unless you are standing akimbo and kind of facing off with the ocean, uh, it, it, nothing, nothing indecent will, will be shown to those in the rooms. And as we continue on uh, from here, the next day, uh, after staying in Katsura, uh, we go to visit the Katsura fish market. Uh, this is where the largest haul of fresh tuna is brought every day in Japan. And those tuna are then transferred to uh, the markets in Tokyo and other places. So some people fly down from Tokyo just to get the freshest fish, uh, the freshest tuna in Japan. You can see at the top left picture uh, is a bluefin tuna catch. Even the fishermen are taking photos as it's, it's becoming more and more rare to get a bluefin this big. Uh, I asked them how much this might go for and they said probably around $50,000 US for, for the one fish. Following our stay in Katsura, uh, we travel to visit the last of the Grand Shrines and we go by train to Shingu city. Shingu means the new shrine. 
Uh, this is due to uh, the story of the gods coming here. They, they visited the Gotopiki rock, which is the bottom left picture, and before separating into the three grand shrines. And as they left the Gotobiki rock, they had to make a new shrine. That's, that's Hayatama Shrine. So the whole city is called New Shrine and Hayatama is its central focal point here. Uh, our final climb, it's a very relaxed day walking through Shingu on this day, but if you are up for it, you can uh, attempt the 538 stair, stone stair ascent to the Gotobiki rock. Uh, often the down causes a bit of vertigo, so we go very slowly. And there is a, a, a Matsuri, a festival here. You can see in the mandala to the right, all the fire coming down the mountain represents uh, one of the more ancient festivals. Uh, every year in February, they will, uh, by the hundreds, locals will run down the mountain uh, with flaming torches. And whoever makes it down first without breaking a leg uh, becomes sort of the, the town hero. Uh, following our visit to Shingu, we take a train up to Ise and uh, we visit the outer shrine as well as the inner shrine the next day. And I would need a longer presentation to fully describe Ise, uh, but in short, uh, it is an amazing place where there's 123 shrines that are branch shrines of the larger uh, inner and outer uh, Ise grand shrines. It is where uh, the sun goddess is housed, the sister in the origin story. So uh, in our narrative, we actually are able to visit through the grand shrines and Issei shrine. We can see the brother, uh, the mother, the father, and the sister. And uh, it is known for, its, uh, um, for being rebuilt every 20 years in total. So the, the grand shrine, as well as all of the, the, the surrounding branch shrines are rebuilt. Uh, it's an eight year process and it's a very good example of sort of sustainable knowledge acquisition. Uh, if there's ever a war or a fire, um, the whole town knows how to rebuild these, sh these shrines from scratch down to the very minute uh, decorative detail. Uh, it's a style of architecture that is called Yuitsu Shinmeizukuri, uh, the one and only divine architecture. And uh, it's uh, unique in the Shinto tradition uh, you may have heard of Kasuga style architecture or other styles of building shrines, but this one is reserved for Ise. Uh, it looks very similar to uh, the, Roy, the old rice storage houses. Uh, rice also features quite prominently in the Ise uh, spiritual narrative as um, the first kind of the progenitor of the human race. Uh, the first human was given a rice stalk from the sun goddess who is housed here. Uh, you cannot go into the main shrine and take pictures. In fact, only the imperial family is allowed access to the uh, inner inner shrine. Uh, you can take a final picture here. So I've got at the end of the tour, everyone has uh, coalesced as a group and, and is very happy to have made it to this point. Um, and we take a photo uh, at the same point where um, I think the G7 uh, Prime Minister Abe and Obama and a bunch of other people took their, their famous photo here. Following that, like the pilgrims of old, um, we have to party at the end of this. So we go into uh, the town that leads up to the shrine. Um, the Okage Yokocho is, is uh, this area that is full of shops. You could spend a good two hours there. They have uh, taiko performances. They have all sorts of local things to try and, and sample. Um, so we spend some time here before heading back to our accommodation to pick up luggage and then people are off um, and we uh, tour leaders will help them buy their tickets on to the next point in their journey. Ah, I've just thrown this in here to show you the another famous thing in Ise is the Ise shrimp or Ise lobster, um, which is a delicacy and uh, you know we meet all sorts of people people on our tours. This was our last Kumano Kodo uh, lead, uh, tour, guided tour was last November and I just led two people on it. Uh, we had a great time and uh, 
uh, we were able to talk to this, this you say lobster farmer for a while and, and hold the, the lobster you can see. Um, the person I'm leading is very excited about that. Ah, I'm also including um, Yuasa here just to give an idea of uh, what we see on the self-guided tour. So we skip Koyasan and Osaka, we skip Issei on the, on the self-guided tour, but we include this small fishing village as a start. Um, it's close to the beginning of the walk. Uh, you can spend a day walking around um, the site of, of the original traditional town um, where there is still a very famous um, soy sauce making factory. Um, there's also a little museum that's based out of a bathhouse. So this is the upper left corner, the Jimburo bathhouse. Uh, and it's, it's got two floors of sort of antiques and, and old um, things that represent the old sort of lifestyle here that you can, you can wander around. And of course the fermentation culture is the main thing here. So if you would like to learn more about koji mold uh, and how it's used to uh, malt rice, which is the basis for soy sauce and for miso and for sake as well. Um, you can learn all about that here. The middle picture here says koji ice cream. So you can try a fermented malted rice ice cream as well. Stay at a number of different accommodation in the area. Um, very small, nice inns with uh, onsen baths and beautiful, beautiful meals. And we also offer a, uh, a walk from Yuasa. If you've arrived very early in Yuasa, uh, some people prefer to, to start the day early, get here before check-in, and they'll leave their bags at the inn before um, attempting this 7.5 kilometer walk. And it's a, it's a fairly easy walk. You can see the graph on the bottom. It's just about a 100 meter elevation gain in line with our idea of, of starting easy and building up. Um, it, it is a beautiful walk actually, and it actually gives you a chance to walk one of the other sections of the Kumano. So um, visiting Koyasan in that area uh, is, is beautiful and a wonderful opportunity on the guided tour. But I also recommend if you've been to Japan before on one of our tours guided, um, you might want to try a self-guided on your next time around. Um, so this is the, the pass, the very sunny area uh, known for its, its uh, sudachi and mikan citrus production. Ah, the final slide here is just uh, showing you some of the things we watch out for on tour. These are not particular to the Kumano Kodo, but uh, we do see more wildlife on this tour. Um, some snakes, there's two varieties that are considered poisonous. This is the less poisonous variety of Yamakagashi, it's called. Um, and there's another one, the Japanese pit viper, that uh, on the wetter conditions of Kumano, we, we watch out for in certain seasons. Also, the top right is the Japanese hornet, which is, by the numbers, more dangerous than, than anything else. About 40 people a year uh, uh, die from stings from, from these bees. Um, but it's very rare to have any problems with them unless you panic and swat at them. And uh, we see deers, we see monkeys, uh, we see the remnants of uh, nocturnal wildlife, like wild boars and things along the route, turning up the soil along the trails. But I would say in general, um, like uh, we, we don't encounter anything that would cause any alarm, major alarm along the route. Yes, uh, so uh, to end the tour here, I think I'm probably out of time. Um, maybe Giorgio can let me know. If you have chosen any of these final stories that you would like to hear, we'll see if we have any time or I can tell you a bit more about them if you come on tour with us. So uh, thank you very much. In Japanese, we say, Go seicho, arigato gozaimashita. Thank you for listening. And back to you, Giorgio. Thank you, Jamie. That was um, very interesting. 